lecturer at the Faculty of Engineering of UNAM. Uh, his main research topics include quantitative aquifer assessment, environmental hydrogeology, and land subsidence processes. He published a number of papers, it's a huge list, including groundwater, hydrogeology, um, el, journal of hydrogeology, uh, hydrogeological process. So let's invite Dr. Hernandez Priu so that he can talk about groundwater investigations in the Faculty of Engineering, UNAM. All yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. I, I first of all would like to thank uh, Dr. Roy for his kind invitation to this interesting workshop. We are looking forward to potential collaboration with uh, our experts and colleagues from India. So, uh, well, the aim of, of this talk will be uh, to show you a brief overview of what we have been doing in terms of groundwater investigations in our group. I work in the Faculty of Engineering, so I'm not a pure scientist. So we like practical issues, practical uh, solutions. I don't know if that bad or good, but uh, I mean the aim is to show you a brief overview, of some quick examples of, of our work. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, our uh, group's collaborators, Alberto Arias Paz. Alberto will be our field coordinator during this uh, workshop. Also to Darío Solano Rojas, which is here. Darío recently uh, got a position in the Faculty of Engineering as, a, as an associate professor. Uh, he's a very young and talented and smart guy. Uh, Sergio Macias Medrano uh, and Javier Mancera Alejandres. So we have a, a small group, but we like to work. Uh, well, uh, okay, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, an overview of glo global groundwater, as we, everyone knows here. Uh, our research group, uh, our research line, and some quick examples uh, related to it. Well, it's not surprised that groundwater is very important for our, uh, our planet, for our human development, is the Earth's largest freshwater reservoir. We know that agriculture is the main groundwater user. Worldwide, 55% of global agriculture depends on groundwater. And we have an extra 11% as virtual water that is not con uh, contemplated in conventional water balances. So some my authors started to talk about aquifer mining uh, because at least 16 to 33% of groundwater extraction worldwide is related to agriculture as a non-renewable source. So we, we need to better understand our groundwater resources uh, and try to better understand our soft surface resources. Well, uh, uh, as you better know as, as, as we, uh, India is the gold medal champion of groundwater extraction worldwide. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think that's, that will be a major problem for, for you, but uh, in Mexico we are the fifth place. So we both, India and Mexico, depend on groundwater for almost every human development, agriculture, uh, domestic supply. And we have a problem, both Mexico uh, and India. We have, overall, we have low recharge rates and we have uh, huge uh, red dots referring to high abstraction rates. So we, we have an imbalance in our aquifers. So that, that supposes a main scientific challenge for better managing our, our groundwater resources. In Mexico, we have, uh, we have quite uh, deep groundwater levels, sometimes in the order of more than 100 meters. And according to the National Water a Agency, we have uh, a lot of aquifers under over-exploitation. We, we depend on groundwater, depending on the uh, source information, up to 40 to 60 percent of the water use in Mexico is groundwater. Uh, Mexican aquifers sustain almost 2 million hectares of cropland, and we have a major problem throughout Mexico. We have high abstraction uncertainty. We really do not know the groundwater pumpage. And why is that? Because, because we have a large share of unofficial wells. Probably per, per one official well we, we have in Mexico two or three unofficial wells. So we do not know the, the, the pumpage. So how can we manage our 
aquifers if we do not know the pumpage. So that's quite really difficult. And of course, large groundwater rubber draft throughout Mexico. Uh, and this is our motivation. We, we should uh, decided to, to start a research group in the Faculty of Engineering. So I am going to, to show you a, a brief overview of our projects. Uh, we have Alberto, which is uh, a groundwater exploration expert and, and a field hydrogeologist. Uh, we have Sergio Macias Medrano, our GIS analyst and, and detail mapping analyst. And quite recently, we have been exploring some uh, drone and on main aerial vehicle surveys and detailed photogrammetry for doing assisted geological studies. We have uh, Dario uh, over here, which is an in, uh, he's dealing with INSAR based subsidence analysis, processing, and some geological modeling. Javier Mancera, which is really, he's not a hydrogeologist, he's a geotechnical guy, but he's working with rock mechanics and water interactions. Myself, which has, I'm, a, I'm an environmental hydrogeologist. We have students, PhD, masters, and undergrad, and we have been working with colleagues from UNAM's research institutes, mainly uh, here, geology and geophysics, with, with Eric, with Oscar Graciela. Uh, in geophysics, we have been working with uh, Claudia Arango Galvan and with uh, Enrique Cabral Cano. And we have colleagues from Spanish universities and from the University of Texas at Austin particularly from the Jackson School of Geosciences. Well, uh, our research lines uh, uh, deals with a very practical approach for solving actual problems. So uh, we, we developed some, some uh, consolidated research lines such as uh, water supply source evaluation, hydrogeophysics and subsurface hydropetrophysical assessments, in sar based land subsidence analysis, both for relating groundwater overdraft and for dealing also with urban risks, which in Mexico City is quite common. Uh, special distribution of groundwater vulnerability and risk, so like groundwater remediation and groundwater dewatering de for civil engineering applications. And recently we are developing some new research lines uh, related with uh, water energy nexus in unconventional shale place. We really want to to try to understand what is the water volume related to frac wells, to frac uh, a play, a field, uh, because in Mexico we, we are discussing with the new government if we are decided or not to, to develop this kind of shell place. I believe in India you have also shell place, so this is a quite important issue. We are developing some, some uh, methodologies from the oil reservoir engineering to assess well test interpretation. And we are, as I told you before, developing some drone and point cloud based processing for assisted geological studies. Well, I, I will give you a quick examples. Well, uh, Dr. Eric Morales show us a really detailed overview of the problem in Mexico, which is land subsidence, right? We have a clayly aquitar above the main aquifer under exploitation. This aquitar is highly compressible and we over exploitate our aquifer. So as a consequence, we have subsidence. This is a very famous picture of the subsidence processes in the San Joaquin Valley, but we have our famous picture too. This is Alberto in one of the, the main uh, emblematic wells in, in Mexico. This was the surface elevation and the, wa the groundwater pump in 1936. And now the topography is right over here. So, so the subsidence at the time of the photographs, the, the photograph was taken was about eight meters. Uh, uh, we, we, perf uh, we performed in the past some uh, subsidence analysis using INSAR images. You can see here the, the special distribution of the subsidence rate in Mexico City. The, the red zones are uh, values of almost 40 centimeters per year at the eastern part of, the, of Mexico and within the eastern part of the basin, mostly related with the former Great Lake. And uh, we found a really good correlation between high subsidence rate zones and the, and the aquitar thickness. So in that part, of, of the aquitard, which is thicker, we have subsidence. And, and we developed, well, uh, uh, Dr. Enrique Cabral Cano in one of his papers in 2008, 
develop a, a parameter called subsidence gradient, subsidence gradient, which is a, a, an indirect measurement of differential subsidence. Uh, so it's really the, sl the, the horizontal slope of the subsidence. If we have uh, more subsidence gradient, we will have more differential subsidence. So these uh, differential subsidence processes will lead in Mexico City to tensile cracks. Okay? So these tensile cracks, we are assuming that these cracks uh, will lead to new pathways of contaminant transport. So we, are, we link in this study the subsidence gradient to the drastic model to better assess groundwater vulnerability in Mexico City. Uh, and, and well, this is the result. We compare the, the, the model that we call drastic SG. SG stands for a subsidence gradient parameter. And we compare it to the conventional uh, drastic model. As you can see here, this is the, 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 um, uh, the boundary of subsidence zones and no subsidence zones. And you can see here that we, we have several underestimations of the vulnerability if, the, if this parameter is not taken into account. So we, we uh, are suggesting that in subsidence uh, basins, vulnerability studies should consider a parameter related to subsidence. Dario <clears throat> uh, is also exploring several data sets, uh, insert data sets, to, to better assess subsidence processes. He's comparing TSX, Cosmo 1, and Cosmo 2. And it appears to be a good correlation, concluding that in SAR, it really works. I mean, SAR could be able, as a reliable technology, to better assess subsidence values. And uh, surprisingly, he's, he's using this analysis to, to assess, in a very detailed way, the subsidence processes, for instance, along the subway uh, lines in Mexico City. Because in the subway, it's quite common to have differential subsidence processes. So Dario is trying to monitor the vertical velocity of subsidence along the, along the, the, subway, uh, uh, the subway lines through Mexico City with very good results. Uh, in, another in another study, we, we, we assess um, a water supply source evaluation study in one of the most strange and unique places in Mexico, which is the so-called Me the Mezquital Valley. The Mezquital Valley probably is the largest raw wastewater irrigation district in the world. We have here Mexico City, and you, you see here these blue lines represents uh, sewer, sewer channels. So all the wastewater uh, from Mexico City is discharging through the Mezquital Valley. It's raw wastewater. Well, the, the National Water Agency is, is planning to, to build a new water treatment plant. Uh, but anyway, we, we discharge a lot of wastewater through the, through the Mezquital Valley. So find new and reliable water sources in this kind of environmental settings poses a major scientific challenge. So uh, we use several geophysical techniques to, to better try to understand the soft surface configuration and try to locate potential sites for groundwater well drilling. We use uh, several petrophysical um, tools from well logging analysis, just as Eric uh, Morales told us before, to uh, analyze uh, the spatial distribution of resistivity and transform it to the spatial distribution of porosity and storage coefficients to better understand uh, the, the, the aquifer configuration uh, in the subsurface. Uh, we, we, we perform a lot of cross-sections to, uh, to get petrophysical signatures of the different hydrofishes in the study area. Uh, the, the challenging part in, in that study was to identify the, the yield, the, 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 the yield related to each hydrogeological unit because we have uh, a fracture aquifer, uh, a granular aquifer, we have aquitards. So we, we use the silica content and the long number signature to classify the petrophysical signature of each one of hydrogeological units to better understand the, the groundwater potential in the subsurface. And we could be able to classify uh, the aquitards, granular aquifers, 
and fracture aquifers in terms of their petrophysical signatures. And with this in mind, we, we could be able to integrate all the information in a 3D conceptual model to, to get the, the suitable places for locating new drilling wells in this uh, complex environment. Uh, one thing that we, we explore was the evol groundwater evolution during time. So this is the, ground, the groundwater contour evolution from 1982 to 1998, from 98 to 2007, and considering a long 25 year period from 1982 to 2007. And we performed these groundwater evaluation studies. Here you can see the histograms. And although we have a, a lot of uh, noisy responses, uh, you can see that within the box plot configuration, the median of all the groundwater contours is really close to zero. So we have a very, a very unique case worldwide of a very dynamic system that works under steady state conditions. So it's, it's interesting to us to, to show that a regional system with high abstraction rates, with a base, comp base flow component to the main river, with recharge from rainfall, and a lot of hydrological components works as a steady state condition because the wastewater infiltration ultimately regulates all the hydraulic balance. So this was really interesting for us, and we published this. Well, uh, on the other hand, talking about water use uh, related to shell plays, we have been exploring in the, in the recent past, uh, for the last probably two or three years, uh, trying to understand the water use and the water volume related to the fracking. We use a lot of figures in the press, in the environmental agencies, but we need to get some objective figures about how many water is needed to frack a well within a gas production window, within a, uh, an oil production window, per, per well, per play, per field. So, uh, well, this is very important for hydrogeologists because worldwide we have a huge shale potential. And in India, you have a lot of place too. In Mexico, we have... Um, several transboundary formations between Texas and us. And well, this is very contrasting because Texas is probably the, the champion in the world of developing this kind of, of place. The Texas has several major plays. One is uh, the, the so-called Eagle Ford play, which is a transboundary play between South Texas and North Mexico in Coahuila and other places is uh, the Haynesville uh, uh, play, which is a, a shared play between Louisiana and Texas. The Barnett, the Barnett play, which is the pioneer play in the world, started production in 1990s. And the, probably the, 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 the largest uh, unconventional play currently is the, the so-called Permian Basin. Well, we, we decided to study the water use in Texas as a proxy to understand the water, the, the, the projections of water use in Mexico once that hydraulic fracturing takes place in, in our country. This is uncertainty because uh, the former government was strictly decided to explode shale place and now our new president is, is not convinced of this. But as a hydrogeologist, we, we better do our job in terms of understanding the water use and do the politics uh, follow a, path, a, a different path? Well, this Eagle Ford play started production in, in 2008. It's a junk play with only 32 wells. And look, the, 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 the development growing. In, tw in 2013, more than 8,000 wells were drilled. And now the Eagle Ford has about 18 oil and gas wells and, and, and 2,000 new permissions with an, an oil production of 1 million barrels per day. So this is a very productive play. So probably for the, the oil companies are thinking, hey, if we have a lot of oil here, why don't we decide to explore in Mexico? But we, we, we should have a, a research question. What will be the hydraulic fracturing source in Mexico? We have a, a, very, a very arid region over here. So 
probably the main hydraulic fracture in water source will be groundwater. And the groundwater is also is already compromised by sa but to satisfy agriculture, human consumption. The rainfall is so 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 little, so probably groundwater will play a key role in developing this kind of place. Well, this is an example of hydraulic fracturing development in Texas. You can see here this is small this is uh, this is small square. Well, it's a well path, and well pa one well path usually has between four to eight unconventional wells. And if we multiply each well per 40 million liters of water, because that's the water needed for, for, for developing fracking, that's a lot of water. So if we decided to overexplode shallow groundwater, we will have a problem. So we better get this job done. Okay, so with this research question in mind, we decided to study the, the transboundary um, continuation of the, of the Eagle for play within the, within the uh, Sabinas, uh, Reynosa, and Plataforma Burro Picachos basins in Mexico. These squares here, these green squares, are referring to the leasing blocks that the government is pretending to lease for unconventional production. Uh, these are only the 20 or something exploration wells that the old, the old uh, government company, Pemex, drilled in the recent past. You, you can compare the number of wells in the, in the Texas Eagle 4 against our wells. This is also knowledge, so we, uh, we do not know very much about the geology. So uh, we decided to perform some statistical work during 2015, 16, and 17 in Texas, and we, we get with, those, with these numbers, um, for instance, the, the hydraulic fracturing water per well was about 20,000 cubic meters per well, but it's increasing, and in 20, uh, 2017, we are reaching about 40,000 cubic meters per well. The accumulated water is, is a lot in 2015, uh, the Eagle 4 play use 75 uh, million uh, cubic meters of, uh, of water. And if we, s if we can be able to see the whole, wind, the whole production period from 2009 to nowadays, we are seeing an increasing trend of water use. And this is an important message for us. No, no, uh, uh, independent of the number of wells, the the, um, the hydraulic fracturing water use per well is always increasing. So we, we should keep this in mind for our development in Mexico, because this will lead to some problems here. And we have all the statistics. Um, we, we, in, in the US, we had access to really cool databases. Um, huge databases, so we perform a lot of data science and data analysis with one of our PhD students, Saul, which is uh, very good in programming in, in Python and all that stuff. So we, we uh, plot all the spatial distribution of the oil and gas wells. You can see here, for instance, this is the vertical part of the well and this is the horizontal part of the, of the oil and gas wells. In the horizontal part of the well is where hydraulic fracturing is taking place, not in the vertical part. So the focus should be, should be made in the horizontal part of the, of the well, because that is wh where fracking takes place. So we calculate uh, the water use per length of lateral, and we get with this number, which is in the order of 20, 25 cubic meters. So, so the water use is in the order of 25 cubic meters per meter or of length of lateral. So this is a good number to, 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 for projection purposes. And we, we, we run some simulations, some management simulations using uh, several projections for Mexico in order to get a spatial distribution of the potential water stress index in Mexico considering potential projections of hydraulic fracturing development scenarios. And we get with these results, considering that we, d that we decided in Mexico to, uh, to develop um, shale gas 
in the order of the median rate of the Texas Eagle for play, this will be the water stress distribution in Mexico along the leasing blocks. We can see that uh, we have plenty of, of uh, leasing blocks within the, within the low water stress index, but several leasing blocks with problems related to water stress index. If we decided to increase the project, to increase the Texas development rate and develop a projection considering the maximum rate of the Texas Eagle 4 rate, we will have serious problems, okay? We will have problems in terms of water stress in groundwater and in total water, okay? So this, the, the take home message is in order to protect water resources, we should keep in mind that we would not to further develop more than the median rate in, in Texas, okay? An increasing rate will largely damage groundwater resources in, in the northern part of, of Mexico. Well, talking about totally different, we are also exploring um, some well test analysis developed from the oil reservoir engineering. Uh, as, we, as we, everyone here knows, pumping tests remain probably the method of choice among hydrogeologists, right? To deduce transmissivity coefficient, storage coefficient and so, that stuff. But if we look at the oil reservoir literature, uh, these guys are using the same theoretical approach. They are pumping a reservoir and they are also developing uh, like a pumping test. It is called in the old reservoir uh, field, a pressure test, but they are using way more advanced tools, more modern use techniques, because uh, if, we, if we review the literature, both Thais or Neumann on, or, or Cooper Jacob is a really good approach, but some of these techniques were published almost a century ago. So what happened then? So uh, if, if I put, put you this example of uh, with knowing nothing about geology and we decided to, to assess this problem in terms of the Thracian drought and response, we should look that these two curves are quite similar and we probably we do not be able to understand what is happening in the well or in the aquifer by only analyzing this curve. But if we decided to add the derivative response of this drawdown, which is, it is called in a literal to diagnostic plot, we should be able to recognize a little bit more about the hydrogeology. For instance, we, we, can, we can develop uh, a diagnosis related to wellbore storage because both the derivative and the drawdown share the same, the same configuration with a unit slope behavior. And, and, and this, the part between the drawdown and the, the, the derivative can tell us about skin, about a damaged well. Or here, we can, we can have a parallel behavior with a half unit slope between the drawdown and the derivative. And that behavior is indicative of a fractured media aquifer. So if we, we, we have been exploring in the group to re, reinterpret all pumping tests by, by using this simple approach, which is adding one more curve, the derivative, and we, uh, we, are, uh, we are getting exciting results in terms of, of uh, take home message. Hydrogeologists should be able to add this tool firstly developing the oil and gas industry to better understand our aquifers. And it, it's not complex, it's quite simple. Uh, the derivative analysis is a powerful tool to identify flow regimes. For, ex for instance, radial flow, where Thais and Cooper Jacob is valid, linear, spherical in one single plot. No need to use specifically type curve matching analysis. Is 100 compatible with classic techniques? It gives us a high resolution in fracture media and to identify boundaries is quite easy to use. And using analytical methods, we can be able to estimate non-conventional parameters, 
such as channel aquifer widths or fracture, uh, hydraulic conductivities related to fractures or distance to boundaries. However, it has a main drawback, which is the derivative is a noisy signal. So we need to run an extra smoothing algorithm to better understand this situation. So in, in the group, we are developing some smoothing algorithms uh, using valuable help from your physicists, because your physicists understand way better than the geologist the signal processing. So we, uh, in the recent past, we, are, we, we use the typical algor smoothing algorithm, which is increasing the, the, the derivative window size. This is called the Boudet algorithm, but it's, it has some drawbacks as pointed out by several actor, uh, authors. So we develop a new derivative smoothing algorithm based on quartic B splines with free knots. We published this in Grand Water last year. And you can see the difference. You can see here that even with the Burdet algorithm, you have some noisy responses with the derivative. And with the spline, we, we, we get a smother, smoother signal, which is better for aquifer testing interpretation. And if we decided to run the second derivative, the second derivative by Brudet's algorithm is basically unreadable. But with the spline uh, filter, you get a smoother response. And the petroleum guys are developing some exciting applications of the second derivative. I mean, the second derivative has also hydrogeological and physical meaning into the reservoirs or in the, or in the aquifers itself. Uh, in order to have a new computer tool for students, professional professors, we develop a new and freeware computer suite for assessing diagnostic plots, which is, is freeware. You can, you can log into the website aquidplot.com, uh, aquifer diagnostic plot. It's a really simple tool. It is not pretending to compete with the commercial tools, of course, such as aquifer test or ActiSolve, but it's a simple to use tool specifically developed for students and professors uh, to analyze pumping tests by using the derivative analysis. It has some smoothing algorithms. It has several flow geometries. We, we can be able to calculate um, cool parameters. And it has some, some features that we are trying to improve over time. But the beta version is already released. It, uh, uh, it's a, it is a suite because it has three components. The website, uh, you, know, you don't need to install anything. Just log into the website and start to use the tool. We have uh, um, an Excel spreadsheet program in Visual Basic. And we have an app for a mobile devices. So you can perform a real time uh, interpretation at the field, uh, in the field level. Okay, uh, uh, finally, uh, Alberto Arias, one of uh, our field coordinator, he developed in the past some basic uh, numerical modeling uh, projects to understand uh, the declining groundwater levels and the groundwater dewatering techniques, or schemes, sorry, to uh, be able to decline water levels in a vent within a sewer system in Mexico. This is a very common problem in Mexico City. Civil engineers started to drill a vent, and they don't know nothing about hydrogeology. So the vents started to flow a lot of water. So the numerical modeling is a good technique for starting to analyze uh, the watering patterns uh, along, along uh, or surrounding the vent, the starting to play with flow rates, with positions throughout the bands and started to develop some techniques about groundwater modeling. And, and we, we, we tested these simple numerical techniques with a lot of field and geological observations to uh, design the watering uh, schemes in several engineer, civil engineering applications, including bands in sewer systems, including slope stability uh, schemes, including uh, railroads, including a, a lot of things related to it. OK. Well, so I hope I can be able to, to have a quick look of what we are doing in, in the group. And we are looking forward for 
potential collaboration and for projects with our experts and colleagues for, from India. This is also, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Maybe now, Eric, thank you so much, uh, Antonio. Uh, Eric, maybe you can come on stage with Antonio and you can both take questions from the audience and generate a kind of discussion. I can give you this one. Okay, thank you. Do you stay, Eric? We have to take a group photo. So we'll have lunch break from 1.15 to 3 o'clock. So at around 3 p.m. we'll be meeting again here. In the afternoon we have four talks. So at around 1.15 we all go out in between Geology and Geophysics Institute. Uh, somebody is waiting for us to take a group, group picture. So we have a big group today. So thank you. So. so, 300 years prediction we have done. Uh, predict, pre predict. Predict, prediction for 300 years modeling in modeling. Uh -huh. yeah, yes. You have gone for uh, projection 300 years you have yes. considered. Will it be uh, correct? Because uh, the land use and other things are very dynamic, changing very fast. But how will you account all those uh, things when you go for very long-term uh, prediction? Yes. Well, uh, this was a synthetic uh, example. Uh, the boundary conditions were uh, the top uh, head, the, the head at the top of the model was kept fixed, and the bottom uh, boundary of the model was uh, uh, imposed a su sudden uh, instantaneous change in hydraulic head of five meters. We, uh, the, because of the hydraulic conductivity of the, of the section, it was only 15 meters uh, thick. The flow is so slow that it takes almost 300 years. Well, it depends on the realization. In the, when we use constant parameters, it goes all the way to 270 something uh, because since we have constant head at the top and at the bottom mm -hmm. we reach steady state on, once uh, the flow is uniform through the whole uh, section so we, we compute the flow at the top boundary and the bottom boundary and it reaches the the uh, the same value up to 275 meters uh, years for some realization when, when you use the random case sometimes it may take 1000 years uh, so uh, the the if we had a constant cha constantly changing uh, type of boundary which would be the what, what we would expect in real situations for example recharge uh, Richard uh, at the at the at the top of the uh, aquifer or or the aquifer and uh, cycles of uh, uh, pumping at the bottom in the, in the contact with the aquifer, then it would be a complex signal, and but every change would take a long time a long time to dissipate and to equilibrate this. Uh, this would be a dynamic system and it would be changing. So we, we, we are also uh, checking this type of behavior, I mean, uh, uh, with, with changing uh, dynamic boundary conditions. For you, one question. So in uh, India, particularly in the southern part of India, so when they go for uh, shale, ga shale gas, if they go for drilling, so people are uh, against that. They are uh, fighting against the uh, government. It is not the case in Mexico or in U.S. Whether it uh, are you, the Indian government is banning the, the process? The government is very much interested in exciting. Uh, People are objecting. Uh -huh. They are not allowing to drill wells but for oil, farmers, shale gas, farmers. farmers. Uh-huh, okay. Because uh, land subsidence may take place or something like that. 
or it will pollute the ground water so they are not allowing to drill for uh, shale gas production oh, congratulations it's a very big issue there <laughs> in india <laughs> what about your idea okay government we can allow the government to take hydrocarbon or uh-huh. ban for extraction of the okay. hydrocarbon well congrats i mean in mexico we have uncertainty about what will happen in the in the near future as i told you before the the former government uh, had a really position about developing developing all these shell plays and now the new government uh, is is objecting this process but uh, i mean in the meantime we as uh, professors or scientists we should be able to understand this we have a, a contrasting situation in mexico i don't know if india india is the same but The, the the case that I show is an arid region, so we rely on groundwater for potential hydraulic fracturing sources. But we have also shale plays potential in in the southern part of Mexico near the coast in Veracruz, and that's a, a hydrological contrasting situation because the rainfall is quite high, and we have shallow levels of groundwater, so we have we have water there. The other thing that we we didn't discuss is the water quality, or the seismic induce, or the changes in land use. So it's really anthropogenic, aggressive. So personally, I'm I'm not a favor of fracking. <laughs> If I may add to to that, uh, uh, please precisely with respect to water quality, uh, there is a recent paper by Jennifer McIntosh and co-authors where they explore the thickness of f- fresh uh, groundwater. I mean, w- once we uh, drill deeper and deeper, we uh, expect to find more saline uh, water. But at this boundary of this limit, where the, the uh, total dissolved uh, solids goes f- from beyond 3,000, for example, 3,000 milligrams per liter or 10,000 milligrams per liter. And uh, how can we protect? I mean, uh, nowadays there are not many uses for, for those, those uh, kinds of salinities. But uh, still, I mean, the, 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 uh, because of the pressure of the contamination on, on the top of the system and this situation of saline water at depth, Uh, the actually the window of fresh water is not so uh, large and we don't I don't know in India but in Mexico we don't have information to place this uh, lower boundary in terms of quality so it's that's a, in an addition on certain uh, a, a factor that we need, need we would need to take into account when we deal with this operation Also, I, I may add, in, in Texas, one of the major hydraulic fracturing sources is brackish groundwater. And probably that will be a partial solution. But we, we didn't know almost anything about brackish groundwater in Mexico because, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, who cares to study salt water, right? But now there's a lot of uses related to brackish groundwater. And in that place, we have deep brackish when water so probably as scientists we can uh, propose a scientific study on assessing the water quality and hydraulic parameters and geometry and all that stuff about brackish groundwater this is a question re- might be related a little bit but uh, what do you think about the zero day of uh, without water because already south africa cape town sorry excuse me zero day water what ah, without water. water no water because south africa cape town has already declared and mexico city is on the fifth on the list and in india you have bang bengaluru uh-huh. what do you think about the engineering uh, as a groundwater geologist mm. <laughs> that's a really tough question eric can you help me <laughs> the, this question is not for alone for the mexican side for no, the indian yeah. side also because it is not the problem in the mexican side in india also you have, you have the same problem the same problem that's what wow uh, you want to answer first the 
just sorry, I, I didn't understand one part of the what 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 the what zero, happened with zero zero day. It is called zero day. Zero day. No water for drinking. Oh, uh, when we don't have water for yeah. We don't have drinking water. Cape Town is on first on the top of the list. Until April 16th, they have declared. We died. No water. No water. City declared. Bangalore. Bangalore in. Uh, uh, maybe. Nos morimos. Well, storage capacity of Mexico City is almost unexistent. Probably, probably Oscar Escolero is more able to answer that. He he worked with vulnerability of sources of of of, of water sources of Mexico I, I City. I the question. To but me. but, but in principle, to... Mexico City don't, does not have uh, storage capacity. I mean, there are. Uh, metropolitan areas that rely on dams. We don't have dams for for Mexico City. We would need to build aqueducts, aqueducts to, to to bring this type of uh, water. Importing water is already happening, uh, and there are plans to to bring uh, uh, water and start uh, bringing water from from different areas, and. That is cause, causing a lot of social uh, issues and social, social problems. But maybe Oscar may uh, want to add something. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, in uh, in India, so one one in, thing. Okay, no, yes. one, he, he one says thing. in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> in the afternoon, in India, there is no restriction for drilling wells. There is no restriction to, will, no, to drilling no, wells. No restriction. Anybody can drill wells. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. They can go up to any depth. That's why you are yeah. the gold Zero medal champion. Moving to <laughs> and, and, and what about the, I mean, is there restriction on the volume that they can extract or? No restriction on volume, number of wells, depth, no restriction. Anybody yeah, can drill okay. any number of wells. But uh, uh, now they are thinking on desalination of water, seawater. Yeah. Sea In water. Mexico. And they are giving for the coastal cities. Yeah. In Mexico, this is uh, controlled by uh, the federal government. Are there. Uh, in, the cons in, the, in, in the constitution, water is uh, owned. Right. It's owned that by the nation, yes. by the country. Like minerals. And and they right and they give concessions to to individuals and companies. Uh, as as Antonio said, uh, sometimes that is not. I mean, there is. One thing, the legal part, and there is another part that involves the ability and the capacity of the of the federal agency to enforce, to really enforce that, and that is uh, really weak. And nowadays, with this um, uh, um, period, it is it's getting worse. And uh, another thing is the free electricity in India. To get vote, they are giving free electricity for farmers. So they are, 24 hours they are pumping out water. So let me correct uh, what our uh, Professor Subramani was telling. But it is not like that where our uh, Central Groundwater Board it has initiated. They have initiated where uh, along with national mineral policy, they have also went for uh, national water policy where each and every people, those who are extracting water, for example, farmer, so he will be having his quantum of water, he will be having restricted quantum of water for him. So it has been initiated in India, and uh, no, it will be implemented definitely, because we don't have water, and uh, as per uh, my comment with reference to zero day, so there is no such day like that of zero day. It is all with reference to the political issues that is pertaining to India as well as your, uh, uh, your Africa. So because uh, we want to uh, regulate the quantum of water usage in a particular region, it cannot be done. So for that purpose, we are, um, we are at the pose of threatening people so that we are nearing zero day. So you have to reduce your quantum of water that you are using for uh, a drinking or domestic or for agricultural purpose. That is the only intention where they have brought this uh, zero day as a uh, main concept. So I think uh, that uh, uh, with reference to Cape Town, so earlier it has been announced during 2017 April, then they slightly pushed it to after six months. Now they are slightly pushing it to the next six months. 
where the quantum of water usage has uh, uh, drastically reduced now they have excess water for their uh, all utilities so it's so draining not yeah. for, not draining for for more more wealth actually in in mexico there are several areas where this um, um, ban has been enforced uh, these are called aquifers en veda. It means uh, aquifers or administrative regions that, is, that, that no more drilling is allowed. However, for municipal purposes, it is uh, allowed only for, for, for uh, water su drinking, su drinking water supply, but for, no, not for other uses, it is not... Uh, it is not uh, uh, allowed. So yes, it is being th this type of uh, 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 strategy has been implemented since the 40s, 1940s, the first uh, ban, uh, probably since 1940s or, or so. In, and in India also we have states, for example, we have union territories like that of Pondicherry where no people is allowed to directly access water. Only government is giving water to agricultural people, to home needs. So it is being controlled by the government. Where the saline water intrusion, uh, it is controlled by the local government. Okay. Where there is no traces of saline water intrusion. So this is, this is also happening in India. Okay, but I have one question. What, what measures you have to, to compute or control the groundwater pumpage if Uh -huh. Artificial recharge, they are doing. Rainwater harvesting, they are doing. You have a lot, of, a lot of managed recharge yes. projects. Managed aquifer recharge, they are calling. Managed aquifer recharge, they are doing. Do you have any such kind of methods here? Uh, it's been yes. There are some experience in that in that sense. My uh, my question in, about uh, your experience in India is how do you finance that? I mean, I guess a lot of that is through word of the communities. But, uh, but no, no, what is the experience? Government, government is doing. State governments, local governments, they are doing uh, harvesting, rainwater harvesting, they are doing. They are releasing fund. No control. No system. No. Some collab public partly, 50% is public, 50% is private. And also, for example, if you are going for a new building, it should have a rainwater origin structure. And so then only they will be giving permission for that particular building. Mandatory. Yeah, it is mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. New buildings need to have harvesting, yeah. rain harvesting then only systems. They will be given they will permission. Get water supply. Power supply they will get. Yeah, uh, that, yeah uh, that would be, I mean, I think here in Mexico City and in other places, we have lost a lot of opportunities to, to, to start doing some some measures like that hernandez is for you on behalf of the mexican indian geoscientific alliance thank you very much Thank you, Tonio. Well, please use microphone so that everybody can listen. Because many people here, they are just seeing that you are having a conversation, interesting conversation with Eric and, and Tonio, but they are not able to understand because you are not using microphone. So whoever is asking, please use the microphone so everybody will be listening. Thank you so much. We can proceed to uh, uh, between Institute of Geology and Geophysics. Now we can have a group photo. Then we'll have lunch break till three o'clock. We are meeting again at three o'clock sharp. We'll be proceeding with next four talks. Thank you so much.